All right, so of course, as you will get here, we're going to preach the whole counsel of God. I can't think of any other church that I've ever been to, maybe other than Faithful Word, that would preach out of Leviticus chapter 25, right? You're going back to the other, like, what is this? It's actually very relevant for us today. Very relevant. Now, the subject I'm going to be preaching on, if we're spending the most time on, is usury and the oppression of usury. And I'm ho- hopefully it'll help at least somebody in this room and help you not to get stuck in the trap of just being a servant to usury. But I'm also going to cover some other things that we see in this chapter, just about servants and bond servants and things of that nature, because you know the people that hate God are going to want to point to scriptures especially in the Old Testament, and say, and, and they want to judge God, and they come up with all kinds of lies and all kinds of other things, and they'll be mocking the Word of God and say, oh man, do you really, oh, do you know, I, I don't know how many times I've heard it, I just heard it about maybe two weeks ago, someone say, do you know that the Bible promotes slavery? I, have any of you ever heard that before, someone, you're out soloing? Yeah, the hand's going up all over the place, of course. You know the Bible promotes slavery? No, it doesn't promote slavery. But you know what the Bible does do? It actually provides laws on things that happen in real life. So if you make a law about things that exist in the world, it doesn't mean that you're endorsing all of those things. A good example is that you know when God made Adam and Eve, he made man and woman, he designed for a man to have a wife. He designed for a man to leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But what happened? Some people decided one wife wasn't enough, and they wanted to have more. Right? And they had a polygamous relationship, and they would marry more than one woman. Was that God's design? No. It's not God's design. That's not what God intended. That's not what God wanted. But you know what God did in his law? He gave stipulations. If somebody has a second wife, then this is what needs to be done. So in God's law, because he references someone having more than one wife, it's not an endorsement of having more than one wife, but it is something that can exist. And when someone makes a vow, I mean, you're, you're married to that, but you're stuck there. That's the situation you're in. So he gives rules and laws governing such a situation. And it's going to be the same thing with slavery or, you know, and, you know, obviously in the Bible, the Bible does not use the word slavery. And when we think of the word slavery, it conjures up a different picture than what the Bible is talking about when it's talking about servants and bond servants even. So we're going to get into a lot of that as we go through this chapter. It's going to be a little bit more of a Bible study tonight. But going back to just the, the original topic of usury. If you don't know what usury is, it's basically just charging interest. So people charge interest. Now, there's a reason also why I'm bringing it up, because this is very important. If you go to a dictionary today, I went to dictionary.com to get the, not that I didn't know the definition, but when you go to look at the definition of this word, what it's going to say, the very first definition, it says the lending or practice of lending money at an exorbitant interest. That's the first definition. The second definition is an exorbitant amount or rate of interest, especially in excess of the legal rate. So, so in the definition, it's citing like a random law that can change over time as being a definition for a word. That's a little ridiculous because you know what? The, the rate, the excessive rate today might be 20%, but in 10 years it might be 50%, it might be 5%, some other, you know, who knows what that is. But they're just saying, well, it's just exorbitant, it's just a large amount. And then the third definition, definition it says obsolete. The very first word you see, this is obsolete. Interest paid for the use of money. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because when you're reading the Bible, especially the King James Bible, and you see that word usury, this is not defined as an exorbitant or a high amount of interest being charged on money. This is any amount of interest being charged on money being lent. 
That is what usury, that is the biblical definition of the word. Who cares what these other definitions are? I mean, I'm telling you just so that you don't get confused by it. If you run across this word, say, oh, I don't know what this means. I'm going to go to a dictionary and look it up. And you see that word. This is not saying it's okay to charge somebody interest as long as you don't charge too much. Like, oh, you're a brother in Christ. You're a friend. I'll only charge you 2%. Wrong. The Bible definition is just any amount of interest paid. And when you look at the word origin and history of this word, if you go to dictionary.com, it's a, lot, it's a good resource. I like using it as a dictionary. Um, they give you a lot of information on there. And just a tip, if you ever use that dictionary, they give you the like American English version first, first, but then they have British English. And usually the British English is closer to the right definition almost every time because King James Bible was written, you know, in basically in British English. America wasn't even, um, you know, really established then. So the, the 1611 English you're going to find is going to be a little bit better looking at the British dictionary. But all of that being said, this says that it's, uh, this word root comes from Latin and it's uh, usury or interest. So basically the meaning is interest. It says, it says here, though, even in this word origin, it says originally the practice of lending money at interest, later at excessive rates of interest. So they're even saying that originally the way this word was defined was just for interest, but then over time it's just changing to be excessive rates. So just make sure you understand this is not, this, the Bible does not say it's only for excessive rates. It's any interest being charged. Now maybe you can see why this is so important because I think everybody today takes charging interest for granted. I mean, we live in a society of credit cards. I have credit cards. Probably everyone in this room does. Maybe there's someone who doesn't, but it's, it's, it's becoming so accepted to just get in this system of, of debt and paying interest. You want to buy a car. Now, nowadays, what does everybody do? Well, get a loan. Get a car loan. Like, oh, I want to buy a car. Well, I don't, I don't have 20 grand, so I'm just going to get a car loan. They'll charge me interest, and I pay you know, 250 bucks a month. I can afford that and just and don't even think about it. But what happens is that the person that loans you that money, they're going to charge you, you know, 5%, 6%, and whatever, right? Depending on your credit, how, how well they think you're going to be able to pay them back. And they'll charge you a percentage. So you're not just, if you borrow 20 grand, you're not just paying 20 grand back to that person and like, oh, cool, thanks for, thanks for lending me some money so I could buy this car. What you're doing is you're paying them back, you know, and I wish I would now, I would have brought the, the figures, the amortization because they, they'll give you charts. You can look this up. And if you want to borrow an amount of money, you're paying interest every single month. So if you have a minimum payment, your payment's 250 bucks a month, well, maybe, uh, maybe half of that is going towards the principal of your loan, and then the other half is going just to pay interest. So you're paying 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever, you know, paying on the price of your loan, the interest rate, stuff like that. You're just paying all this extra money just because that person lent you money. Like they, they didn't, there, there's nothing else of value there. You didn't like receive anything. You, you're paying the full price of the car, but then you're paying this person like another full price of the car to have that car. So it's like you're paying twice the amount just to have that one thing that you want to have right now. And the Bible says that we shouldn't do that. Now there's, we're going to go through all of this because there's details involved here. It's, 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 Almost basically just don't do it. Okay. But, and the reason why is because it's oppression and you're, you're putting people into bondage by, by charging interest on anything that you lend to them. Keep your place here in Leviticus. We're going to go through this verse by verse and just turn real quick to Deuteronomy chapter 23. There's two verses in Deuteronomy 23 that is a very good summary of this whole thing. And then we're going to go back to Leviticus 25. Deuteronomy 23, verse number 19. The Bible says, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. And that victuals is just food. 
is what that is. It's your sustenance. It's, it's, it's whatever you need to, to survive, live by eating. That's what vittles are. And it's saying, look, if you lend money, if you lend food, anything that you're going to lend to someone, you cannot charge usury. Do not charge interest on that. You say, well, hey man, I need a loaf of bread. I'm hungry. I ran out. You know, okay, I've got an extra loaf of bread. I'll give that to you. But then when you get, when you go and get your bread, you better pay me back two loaves of bread. Right? That, and that's like what they're saying. Now, in our economy, there's probably less of this going on um, w just with the way everything's set up with our supermarkets and things like that in general. At least when it comes between lending amongst each other. Nowadays, you've got banks and, and credit cards and everything else to go to, to to do your lending. But this is actually very serious, especially between God's people and someone that's considered your brother, brother or sister in Christ. You should never be charging them money. Like if someone needs something, we ought to be there to help them out. And we ought to be able to give and, and, and help that person through their rough time. But don't expect to like start getting rich off of them or start making money back off of them, especially for nothing. You know, we're supposed to have compassion and mercy on people and, and just be there to help them out instead of just looking to make a buck off of someone else's hardship, off of their hard times. Because what happens is this is just a, a perpetual cycle of keeping people down. People, you know, it's not it's typically not people who are very wealthy that need to just borrow a whole bunch of money. Because if you're wealthy, you, you have the money that you need to pay for things that you might want. Now, sometimes people are super greedy and they just get all this debt, right? And, and, and they build this huge debt hole that's bigger than what they have, even if they have a lot of money. But this, that's part of the trap, too, is that this, this debt-based society causes people to be covetous. And they, the, the credit card companies, the banks, they want to make money off you. And, and how, look, <laughs> I'm all for people getting paid for producing something, for working and, and creating something or offering a service and like they're actually helping somebody. Someone putting in hard labor, paying someone to come and you know, clean your house or fix your car or do some work for you that's going to be valuable. But what work is being done when someone just says, there you go, and now you're just going to start collecting money because that person had a need and you're going you're gonna to lend them some, some money. There's nothing being done there at all. It's, it's made up. And it's designed to keep people who are poor remaining poor. Because when people need money, you, I mean, you have to do what you got to do, right? You got you to feed your family. Let's say you're working, you're doing everything you can. Maybe you don't have the best uh, education. Maybe you don't have the best resources available to you. And you've got a family and you're trying to do what's right and you're working hard. And you're trying to make ends meet and then some disaster comes up. And you, you, know, you need some extra money. What are you going to do? You have to borrow money from somebody. And that's life. And that happens. And the Bible saying, you know what? It's wicked for you to go then, if you actually have been blessed, if you actually have some money, to go and then say, okay, I see, I could see you're in dire need. Because, you know, the people who are in dire need, what are you going to do? If someone says, well, 20% interest. Well, I need the money. You know, I'm in a bad spot. What am I going to do? And they end up getting oppressed because they have nowhere to turn. And, and now you're just making money off of the poor, people who are already poor. They're never going to be able to turn themselves around and get out of that because now they got to pay this person back and, and then the original debt and everything else. And it just becomes a perpetual cycle. But see, in God's economy, in God's system, he actually planned a way so that, one, people who are accumulating a lot of wealth don't just take over everything. And two, the people who are maybe in bad situations can be freed from their bondage, can be freed from, from a perpetual cycle of this always being a problem with them. And that's what the year of Jubilee is all about. And that, we saw that also in this chapter. So 
It's, it's, a really, it's really interesting. If you take the time to read the Bible and study it and think about it and don't just blow over it and don't just fall asleep and think, oh, this is so boring. Oh, man, why do I have to read this stuff? There's a lot of wisdom in God's Word. And this is the way, if we were smart, we would introduce systems like this today. Because this is real smart. And if you're smart, you'll listen up and pay attention to what the Bible's trying to teach here. And don't get yourself involved in this bondage at all costs. Now, we, look, we live in a society, especially if you want to buy a house or something like that, it's almost impossible to just pay cash for a house. I mean, I get it. Believe me, I know. <laughs> we pay a mortgage. But even that is still a form of bondage because you look at, man, you look at your mortgage statement, look at how much you're giving to the interest. You're paying way more for the interest than you are in the principal every single month. And it's enough to make you sick. But you gotta live somewhere. You gotta do what you gotta do, right? And that's but see, that's where the Bible's saying it's it's not the sin isn't on the person who's in need that just that just you know needs to live and get by. The sin's on the person who's who's who has the means and is just charging that usury and charging that interest on the people. That's wicked. Now I think the best thing to do is to try as much as possible to be self-sufficient and not get into that system as much as you can. Don't get into credit card debt. Don't get into any other debt. You know, there's some things I understand, you know, like when we were moving out here and I didn't have a job and other things, there was some need, but I also knew where there was money coming from that was going to, you know, satisfy some of those needs. And, and even that was a very reluctant to, to borrow any type of money without that money just being there. It's still not the, the wisest move to make. And I understand that there's some situations like that where you can look at it and go, oh, okay, maybe I'll do it this once. But the best thing to do is just to, as much as possible, get yourself self-sufficient. But even more important, um, or uh, just as important, don't get caught up in the commercialism of feel like you need to have everything and need to have everything right now. Work If you want something, work for it. Put aside for it. Save up for it. You might, yeah, you might have to wait an extra few months or a year before you can get it, but that's way better than paying for it for five years. Wait the one year to pay it in full than paying for the whole thing five times over. Because that when you start borrowing the money and paying all this interest, that's what you're doing. And it's a trap. And, and all of this consumerism is just being put in front of your face, especially with the electronics and the gadgets. And you have to have the newest iPhone and the newest you know, smartphone and Android, whatever, all this stuff and these computers. And oh man, they're so cool. And then within like a year, oh, you got that old thing? No, you got to get the newest thing. You know, it's always, you know, nowadays, phone, you know, I remember phones. Well, I remember phones when they're just rotary phones on the wall, right? <laughs> yeah, but a machine for an answer machine. I remember those came out. Anyways, that's nowadays. And then you had the old phones, the flip phones and stuff, and you'd always get a free phone with your service. Like, cool, I get a free phone. Do they even do free phones anymore? I don't know. Do they? I hope so. I mean, <laughs> go, go that route because you don't really need this phone. phone be it. They sell you this stuff because nowadays they're like a thousand dollars. You want to buy a phone? It's a thousand dollars. And you know what they try to do? They 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 push you away from actually even buying them. They just want you on that plan. They just want you paying more money every single month. Just get that money rolling in because in the long run they know you're going to spend a lot more money on this stuff anyway. So um, let's get let's get into the chapter here. It's kind of a lot. Uh, I'm just trying to to give you some of the just practical practical reasoning for, for what the Bible's talking about here with the, with the usury and, and not to get mixed up into this stuff. So uh, we were in Deuteronomy 23, verse number 20 says, and here's a caveat, unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee and all that thou settest thine hand to in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So, basically, you know, the stranger is like a foreigner. 
And this is really designed for people who are not, because if you have a foreigner who's one of the children of Israel that, that joins their nation and becomes like one with them, that's not who this is talking about. This isn't just talking about someone, you know, just because they were a foreigner, but they became like part of Israel. No, this is talking about like other nations and stuff. So if you wanted to land on usury to just like foreign countries, he's saying, okay, you can do that. And then when it came to the heathen, there's different rules. So, um, and we'll get to that too, but we're going through the book of Joshua. And when the children of Israel came into the promised land, they were supposed to wipe out and destroy all the people that were there. But that didn't happen. Some people stayed there. And they were really, really wicked, evil people that should have been killed. But instead of being killed, they made peace with some of them, and they stuck around, and they were causing problems. So those people, God allowed for them to um, be bond servants and to be able to collect usury on, them, on those people as well. Because they were under bondage, and, and God wanted them that way. If, because, I mean, they should have been destroyed. But since they weren't, they were supposed to be kept, um, basically to be kept under, because, because of how wicked they were. Now, um, let's go back to Leviticus chapter 25. Verse number 13, we're going to start reading there. The Bible says, In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. So what the year of jubilee was, was after, so every, let's start with every day, right? Within the days of the week, every seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord. That's what Sabbath means, is the seventh day. And God ordained that the seventh day would be a day of rest. So the day that we know of as Saturday, Sabado, Sabbath, the seventh day of the, of the week, God said, okay, the seventh day is the day of rest, the Sabbath day. He also then created a Sabbath of years. So every seven years, the seventh year was going to be a year of rest for the land. It is, it is a very heavily agriculture, agricultural society, but I mean, it still is today. We have to eat, right? There's agriculture going on. And according to God's law, what he wants to have done is that, and, and, and again, this makes sense too when you understand the science behind it. So you're not just depleting the earth and the ground of its minerals. We get nutrition from the food that we eat. The food that we eat comes and, and gains its minerals and nutrition from the earth, from the soil, from the ground. It picks up what's in the earth and goes into the food that goes into your body. And when you just overproduce on the land, it becomes no longer a source of good nutrition for you. But see, the Bible doesn't teach you all of that stuff. God doesn't go into all the details telling you why you have to do this. He just says, this is the way it needs to be done. And we just need to have faith and trust it. Now, of course, the Bible is going to ring true every single time because it's the Word of God. And you could find out some of these things later, but if we would just, just listen to what God, God's commands and just have the faith and be like, God knows what He's talking about. Because to many people, it might not make sense. Well, what do you mean? I got to wait a whole year, and I can't, you know, I can't go out there and harvest and you know, and really plow the land and work the land. No, let the land rest. That's what he's saying. To give it the rest. So then, for seven more years, for for seven sets of seven, right? Forty nine years. That's seven sets of seven Sabbaths. On the fiftieth year is the year of jubilee. So this happens like once in a lifetime. Right? You get one shot in a lifetime, roughly, right? I mean, it could happen twice, but 50 years, everything gets reset back to where it was. So if you had property, and because everyone had property, God gave all of the children of Israel an inheritance. He gave them their own land. Everybody had their land so that they could sustain themselves. Given to them by God. So someone, either through no fault of their own or through their own fault, whatever, whatever happens, someone comes on hard times, they get poor, they say, well, man, I really need money, I don't have anything, well, I have my land. So I'm going to sell this to somebody else and get this money to help me get back on my feet again, you know, to, to help provide my needs, so I'm going to sell this land to someone else. Well, God said, you can't sell the land, he says, I don't want you selling the land, but when you sell the land, here's what's going to happen. At the end of 50 years, you know, someone else could work that land. They could get the, you know, reap, reap the benefits of having that land, work the land, 
get all the fruit and everything off of that land. But at the end of 50 years, that land has to go back to the person that originally owned it. So it's going back. So that if that person squandered all their money and really got themselves in a mess or whatever, they're going to get that land back again. It's like you're, you're leasing out the land that it never goes away is ultimately what you're doing. And the way that you would value that land, according to the scripture, is you'd say, well, how many years is it until the year of Jubilee? Well, we've got 20 years before the year of Jubilee. So you say, okay, this land is going to produce you know, this much fruit, this much corn, whatever, this much uh, food that's worth this much. So for how many years? 20 years times this much fruit a year. Okay, there's your price. And then they get to lease that for that time. But then God also has it set up to where if you had to do that for some reason, you had to sell your land, you also had the option to go and buy it back, to go and redeem that land. So when you see the word redeem in there, it's talking about redeeming your land back, getting it back. Because that is going to be your source ultimately of, of your own wealth. So if you sell the only thing that's going to actually provide something for you, yeah, you might get back on your feet again, but now you're like, well, how am I going to earn? How am I going to work? How am I going to grow? How am I going to build value? I need, I need something to work on my own now so you can go back and redeem that land. Or one of your relatives can go and redeem it back for you to then to pay that person back and say, okay, here, you know, uh, I'm going to buy this back from you. So you, you get that price then they, they must have had however many years of that point, And you still calculate based off of the year of Jubilee. And that way it keeps say one person, like a J.P. Morgan, from just getting so wealthy that they just start buying up everybody's land. Just be like, well, I want this land. And then it turns into like a feudal state where you have you know, one person in charge and everyone else just a serf just working his land and working for him and paying him everything. If everything is just going right back to the people after 50 years, there's no way someone like that is going to accumulate the, the amount of power and wealth that so, like people today have. And on, like I said, on the flip side, then it's also going to allow for people who are poor to get back on their feet again, to have another chance, to get a second start, to be able to, to, to get that land back and start working at it again. And hopefully maybe if they, if they screwed up in the past, well, I've learned my lesson now, I'm going to work hard. And my kids are going to work hard and we're going to retain this land and we're not going to sell it. That's the economy of the Bible. And that makes sense, but it requires a lot of hard work. It requires foresight. It requires you to not squander and to waste your money. It requires you to work hard for it. I guarantee you there are some people that are just thinking like, wow, I could sell this. and Look at all this money I would have. That would be awesome. And then you could party it up and live it up. And then after a little while, you've got nothing. Just like the the um, the parable of the, the the wayward son, the, the the son that took his father's inheritance and and went and and wasted it all with riotous living, and then he was forced to serve. He was brought into bondage because he squandered all of his inheritance. He had nothing else to, to do. He didn't have any land to work. So he had to go work for someone else that put him into bondage. He was working real hard, real bad jobs, not getting paid much, no one cared about him, and he had to come back home and work for his dad, and his dad received him, of course. But this type of stuff's happened. Let's keep reading here. So that's the year of Jubilee. Verse number 14, the Bible says, And if thou shalt, if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. Usury is oppression. As I mentioned before, you're, you're, you're putting people down. When you're, you're, you're pressuring them, you're pressing them to give you more money than they borrowed from you. According to the numbers of years after the Jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor. And according to the numbers of years. And also, he's saying, you know, you can't price gouge either on this stuff. It's got to be based on the years to the, to the year of Jubilee. So you can't be charging full price to someone when there's like one year left to Jubilee, when it's just going to come back to you anyways. And, um, and, and likewise, you can't be buying it for, for like a super cheap price when you've still got a long ways to go before that's going to come back to you. It's got to be a fair price. Um, let's see, verse number 17. You shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Now, he's going to make multiple mentions, and we're not going to go through every verse again, but at least three times in this one passage he brings up, hey, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
And as he goes through these commands on usury, on being bond servants, and how you treat people, he keeps reminding them, don't forget, you were in bondage. You were in slavery. You had to work hard for someone else. You were being oppressed. You were being worked to death. You didn't have any property. You didn't have anything of your own. Don't forget that when God blesses you and you start getting a lot of money and you're in a position of wealth and you're in a position to, to lend unto other people, don't oppress them. Don't treat them bad. You treat them with respect. You help them out when they need help and you do not charge them interest. And he says, you need to fear God. Why? Because God has the power to bring you down and make you remember where you were. You can do it the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is just listening to his words and say, you know what, fear God. The hard way is, is going, no, I think I'm greedy. I'm covetous. I want to have more money. Oh, this person is such a, I can make so much more money with this. I don't want to lend it to them to help them out, so I'm just going to charge them for it. Wickedness. The Bible says in verse, jump down to verse number 23, the land shall not be sold forever. For the land is mine, for ye are strangers and sojourners with me. So he's saying the land, you can't get rid of the land forever. It's only to, 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 the land, to the time of Jubilee. And he says, anyways, it all ultimately just belongs to God. It belongs to him. You want to come up and preach, son? <laughs> he got away. It's not the time of Jubilee for you yet. You've got to sit and listen to Leviticus for a little bit longer. <laughs> Don't worry, the Jubilee is coming soon. <laughs> but God's explaining here too. He said, hey, you guys are, are strangers and pilgrims through this land. The, the land ultimately doesn't really matter. You're here for a short period of time. Work the land, do righteous with it. But at the end of the day, this isn't your home anyways because you've got a heavenly home. And what the way that we behave ourselves here matters. The way that you treat people here, it's gonna, it's gonna impact. It's literally gonna impact your heavenly home. I'm not saying that that's gonna cause you to go to heaven or not. I'm just saying that your rewards and the things that you earn and what and, and what you're gonna receive in heaven, it's gonna be based on how you live your life here. Let's not get so focused on the things and the cares of this world that it just consumes us and that's all we care about. Verse number 24 talks about the redemption for the land. It says in verse 25, If thy brother be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it. Um, so it goes into all details on redeeming the land. Uh, if, you, if you have a house that's in a walled city, you like literally live like in the wall like on the, of the city, you're saying that's not the same as having land. You know, you can sell that for a year, and if you don't redeem it within a year, then it just belongs to the other person. So um, I don't want to get into all these, some of these details. I'm not saying they're not important, but there's just different rules and the things I want to, I want to focus on. Now, look down at verse number 34. The Bible says, or verse number 35. And if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. So it's saying, look, if, if your brother is poor, even if he is a sojourner or a traveler or a foreigner, if your brother is poor, he says, you relieve him, you help him out. You don't just ignore him. You don't just let his, his pleas fall on deaf ears. He needs help. You help him. And then verse 36 says, take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. You need to help each other out. Don't go trying to make a profit off someone in their hard time. Just help that brother out. Verse 37, Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your, your God. And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, but as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. Now, now we're going to get into the topic of slavery, right? And what the Bible talks about with slavery. And I had to explain this to someone just recently out soul winning. 
Because one, the modern version of the Bible, this is why, one of the reasons why we're King James only, by the way, because it uses the proper terminology for this stuff. The, the, the NIVs and the modern versions, it, it'll use the word slavery. So when the guy's like, oh, do you know that the Bible promotes slavery? Yeah, when you read the false version, they probably do promote slavery. Because it's not using the right term. I explained to the person like this, and you know, I don't remember what he said to this or not. He was, I, he was like drunk or high or something, and, and was kind of being a clown, anyways. He wasn't, he wasn't listening very well. I got his attention a few times, but um, you know, people want to say, you know, because you hear the word slavery, you think, you know, United States, eighteen hundreds. And you just think of what you see on the movies. You think of a black man getting whipped and beaten and treated like dirt and just the, the worst of the worst, right? That's what the imagery that comes to mind. That's what comes to mind to me, to probably everybody in this room. You think of slavery, you're going to be thinking chains, shackles, like, like the worst of the worst. And you know what? Yeah, that is wicked. But you know what? Nowhere does the Bible say to treat somebody like that. It never says to do that. Now, compare that situation with this. I fall on hard times. I don't have any money. I need to feed my family. I go to somebody and say, hey, I need to feed my family. But I have nothing to give you. Can I borrow a couple thousand dollars so I could feed my family? And he says, yes, but here's what you're going to have to do in order to pay me back. Since you don't have any money, you don't have any means to pay me back. I need you to work my land. I need a laborer. I need somebody to, to start tilling my ground. Or let's say you even just you get into debt with someone and you have to pay off that debt. You borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. You're not paying it back. And then the guy says, look, I need my money back. Well, I don't have any money. Well, here's what I need you to do then. You're going to work a job for me. You're going to do this work. You're going to plow this field for me. That's a servant. And if you owe that man money, you could be a bond servant. You're bound unto them because you have a debt hanging over your head to work off that debt. Does that sound like something that's just really wicked? And, oh, I can't believe you'd make somebody work to pay off a debt they owe to you. No, that's normal. That's right. That's the right thing to do. Hey, I owe you, so I'm going to make it right. I'm not just going to turn my back and say, well, no, I'm just filing bankruptcy, so, you know, forget you. And, you know, to be honest, there are a few different situations with people who are bond servants and things like that in the Bible, but... But when you see the word servant as someone working for him, and what we see here is talking about you know, a hired servant versus a bond servant. Someone who's a bond servant, they're bound to that person. A hired servant is someone that goes to get a job. Right? You, if anybody in here that has an employer, you're working for someone, you're like a hired servant because you're serving and you're doing work to earn money. But you can at any point cancel that relationship and not be hired by that person anymore, but, there's no, but you're free to do that. A bond servant is bound usually because they have a debt to owe that they owe, that they just have to pay, they have to keep working it off, at least until they're no longer bound because the debt paid off, then they're free to go and be a hired servant for someone else, but until then they're bound. Does that make sense? So do you hear the word bond servant or the word hired servant? He's, what he's saying here is if thy brother dwelleth by thee wax and poor. So someone gets real poor and they're sold unto you because they have no money, so all they could have is themselves and their work. So now they become a bond servant because they're sold as like as you know as a possession because they have nothing else to pay with. Thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, saying, Don't don't treat him as you would someone that has to serve you. Because you, you can treat people different, right? If, if you want to keep a hired servant on, you're probably going to treat them better than someone that this, they just have to do the work for you. Right? I mean, 
even within families, and I'm not saying that it's always like a, a going to be a, a beating or a whipping, right? But in my own house, if my children don't do something I tell them to do, I could tell them to go do some work, and they have to do it. And if they don't do it, they're going to get a spanking. And I don't have to pay them for that either. But you know what? I'm not going to treat a hired servant that way. If I hire someone to, you know, if I tell my kids to cut the grass, now my kids are pretty young for that, but, you know, just, just use the example. If I, use, if I tell my kids to cut the grass, well, they better go do it, or they're going to spank their butt, right? Because you have to do it. I'm telling them to do it. But if I hire someone to cut my grass, I'm, you know, it's, it's a totally different scenario, right? You treat them different. So this is what the Bible is saying here when you have somebody... He says, look, they're a brother. Okay, they got themselves in trouble. They're poor. They're a bond servant, yes, but you just treat, treat them as a hired servant. You know, treat them with respect. Don't, don't have rigor on them like, they ha like you have to get this done because you owe me. You know, pay that thou which, which thou owest me. And it's that type of an attitude that God doesn't want us to have. Even if, even if it's, you know, the way it works out, Someone gets themselves in that situation, and, and they're in that situation. It reminds me of that that um, that parable. I think I have that. In, I think I put it in here. Yeah. So the, the parable in Matthew 18. You can turn there if you like. Matthew 18. Now, the parable has more to do with forgiveness, but the same attitude that we see here, I think, can be applied to uh, usury and bond servants and, and having that type of an attitude over people who are doing work for you. It says in verse number 23, Matthew 18, it says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So look, this is an, this is an example of someone becoming a bond servant. They owe 10,000 talents, which is a lot of money. This person owes 10,000 talents, so he says, okay, well, since you can't pay me, now you're going to be sold into servitude. You're going to have to work for it, so you and your wife and your kids, you're all going to have to work this off. So someone else is going to pay me that money so that you could work on their land because I don't have any work for you. That's, that's what this is talking about. And then it says in verse 26, The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So he now just, he just forgives him. He lets him free of the debt that he owed. So instead of even making him do the work, you know, this guy's just saying, okay, don't sell us off to be bond servants. You know, I'll, I'll pay you, I promise, I'll get back to you. You know, just give me a little bit more time. And he says, you know what? He has compassion, he forgives him. Verse number 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. So someone else owes this guy now way less money, a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. It's like, you pay me now, you know, and, he, and, he's, and he's, you know, he's, he's treating them really bad, right? Like, he just got let off the hook, and now he's going to this guy going, you pay me my money. And now this guy starts saying basically the same thing, verse 29, and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. So he had no mercy on him, no compassion at all, and he's just like, no, you're going to pay me, you're going to jail. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Obviously this is teaching about just forgiving people for wrongs they've done to you. But what we see here is that same type of an attitude, though, of this guy just being like, you, know, you pay me my money. And what God's trying to say is, you don't have that people, especially with brothers and sisters in Christ. 
someone gets poor, someone falls on hard times, and yeah, they owe you a lot. Maybe they've got themselves in some big debt with you. You don't treat them like that. If they have to do work to make things to, to re make restitution of their debts, great, but you still treat them as a brother, you treat them charitably, you treat them kindly until they can just pay back whatever they owe and you work with them on it and you don't treat them as someone that would be like a bond servant. So um, the, a lot of this chapter, again, teaches the same thing. And then also when it comes to bond servants, the year of Jubilee, though, you're free. There's, n there's not this generational, like, you're a bond servant forever type of mentality. Like this family that's always going to be a bond servant. You go free in the year of Jubilee. But the exception to that was with the heathen that were supposed to be killed. That was the exception. And that was something that never would have even been put in place if the children of Israel obeyed God from the beginning and just wiped out all the heathen of the land. Then that exception wouldn't even exist. But it did for that reason. So... I was going to have you turn to Nehemiah. I don't think we're going to do that. If you read Nehemiah chapter 5, Nehemiah was an awesome ruler. He, he, I really look up to and admire the way, that he, the way that he led and he ruled. Read the book of Nehemiah. But in Nehemiah chapter 5, Nehemiah was setting a lot of things right. This is after they came out. They finally get released from Babylon. Right? They come out of bondage again. because They came out of bondage from Egypt. They got themselves into trouble. They started worshiping false gods. God brought judgment against them, took them all captive. They went captive in the, in the land of Babylon. And now they're finally free. They're going back home. They're rebuilding the city. They're rebuilding Jerusalem. They're getting a fresh start, rebuilding the temple. And Nehemiah is kind of setting things right again and getting people uh, to be doing what they were supposed to be doing all along. But what happens is they have this great jubilee. Everyone's kind of released from their, from their debts. And then the people go right back into the bondage again. And they start complaining, saying, you know, we've mortgaged our lands and our vineyards and our houses just so we could eat, just so we could survive, and we could pay the king's tribute, and we have to do all this stuff. And it was the other wealthier Jews of the land, their brethren, that were charging them interest on this stuff. And Nehemiah is just like, what are you doing? Like, we just got released, and you ju we just had this great jubilee where everyone was set free, and now you're going right back into this bondage again. Like, don't do this. And, and they, they say, okay, yeah, fine, we'll listen to you, you know, and we'll give everybody, you know, back their stuff or whatever. And, and they get right with God. But we need to be aware of the evils of usury and do our best not to participate in it from either end. Definitely not to be charging usury on someone that's your brother or sister in Christ, for sure, absolutely, 100% of the time, never, ever do that to anybody. Okay. But also, it's going to be very wise for you not to get caught up with the credit card, with the loans, with anything else that you're going to be paying interest on. The reason why it's wicked for you to charge someone else is because you're oppressing them. You don't want to get yourself in a situation to be in bondage, to be under oppression by somebody else. Try to learn to live without the things you might want to borrow money for as much as possible and, uh, and realize what you're getting yourself into ahead of time. We need to work hard. We need to not be lazy. Because again, being lazy is a, is, a, is a real easy way to get yourself into debt also. You're not willing to go out and work and, and, and earn the money and pay for things. You just want to have it. So you can borrow from someone else. That's going to bring you into bondage. You're going to be very sorry for being like that and for doing things like that. Because it's going to take you a really long time to dig out of that ditch. And of course, we need to care for our children and work to leave them an inheritance. The Bible says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. That's in the Proverbs. Turn, that last place I'll have you turn. I want to look at this verse real quick and we're done. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. The Bible says in Matthew 6, Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break forth through nor steal. 
For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Getting into debt and in the bondage of just borrowing money, borrowing money usually comes from your focus not being in the right place anyways. We need to focus on serving the Lord. The Bible says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? And be so caught up in that, so worried about, Oh, I need to get food and money and all this other stuff, that you're, that you're going to go and just borrow and get into all, into all kinds of debt. He says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God will take care of you. If you serve the Lord... All the needs that you have, not all of your wants and desires, but all the needs that you have, getting food, getting clothing, God will take care of that for you. If you just say, you know what, before I worry about anything else, I'm going to serve God. He's not saying don't go to work. He's just saying, look, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to live right. God sees you making that type of importance in your life of, of just focusing on his stuff he'll 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 lead you to be blessed to have everything else taken care of i'm not saying he's going to give you the fancy cars and the fancy houses and all the riches of the world he doesn't promise you that because all that stuff is vanity anyways it's meaningless it doesn't matter and if you're so focused on that stuff your heart's in the right place if that's where your treasure is your treasure isn't in heaven. Your treasure is here on earth, and it's just going to get rusty and broken down, and it's all going to burn up anyways. What good is that? Psalm 37, we're starting reading verse number 21. The Bible says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. So look, if you do have to borrow because you're in a bad situation or, you, or you've made bad mistakes, pay it. You pay it again. The Bible says you're wicked if you borrow and you don't pay it back. I remember when the, when the housing uh, crash happened, how many people were dumping their homes because the value went so far down. Because it made financial sense to just walk away from a house and just not pay for it. And I even had friends tell me, hey, why don't you do it? Because I bought it at a really bad time. My house was real high when I bought it, and then it crashed, and then it was like, oh man, you know, like... Like, we owe all this money on this house. It's not worth that much anymore. But I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to back out from the house. because Why? Because I said that I was going to pay for it. Because I made an agreement and I signed my name to it and said, yep, I'll buy this house for this amount of money and this is what I'll pay you. And that's what I've signed my name to do. And the Bible says that a wicked person is going to borrow. Because guess what? I had to borrow in order to buy that house. I didn't have all the money to pay for it up front, so I borrowed. The wicked person's going to borrow and not pay it, and not pay it back. No, I'm going to meet my, meet my obligations. I don't want to be a wicked person. I'm not going to take advantage of some situation and steal from someone else and just dump some other problem off on them. The Bible says in verse number 22, For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So you make the right choices. You, you want to you wanna serve God and put him first. He'll order your steps. He'll help you out. He'll lead you in the right path. And he delighteth in his way. Verse 24, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You're going to live righteously, you don't have to worry about begging bread and not, and not being able to feed yourself and, and, be, and resorting to begging. Because if you're, if you're serving the Lord, he'll take care of you. He promises that. He is ever merciful and lendeth. His seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. I don't remember the Bible reference for this, but basically the Bible says, it might be in Proverbs, that when you lend unto the poor, it's like, it's like you're lending for God, that you don't have to worry about being paid back because God will pay you back. When, when you go and lend to the poor, then it's like you're doing that for God. And, that's, and, and you know God loves to see that. He likes to see the mercy and the help of, of helping people out, not oppressing them, but actually helping them in their time of need and showing mercy. Because he is ever merciful and lendeth and his seed is blessed. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. 
For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut up. God doesn't forsake his saints. Saints just means you're sanctified in Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a saint. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a saint. Because you've been sanctified through the blood of Christ. And you are preserved forever. Usury is a snare. It's going to keep you down. Stay away from it. And don't worry. You know, when these people try to tell you about the Bible, oh, I will promote slavery and stuff. This is coming from people who don't read the Bible. They're just repeating something that they heard somewhere on the internet. They don't know. I always say it's chapter and verse. Tell me. You know so much about the Bible. Tell me. Well, it just does. Well, no, it doesn't. <laughs> You're the one that says it does. Prove it. It doesn't. And if they're going to bring out one of those false versions, be like, that's not the Bible. That's the, that's the NIV. That's the non-inspired version. You, give, you want, why don't you actually use a real Bible? Let's bow right as I word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that we can receive from your word. God, I pray that you please help us to have a right spirit when we study the Bible that we wouldn't um, just get too bored with, with some of these chapters in the Old Testament, and, but that we would actually just, just take the time and, and read them and, and read them intently and stay focused and try to learn from them, dear God. I pray, you know, so many people I know, myself included, would, would have done so much better by taking heed to this knowledge that you provided to us when it comes to borrowing on interest and, and things like that. Lord, that, that could have helped us early in our life. I pray that you please help, especially the younger generation here today, that they wouldn't get caught up and make some of these same mistakes, but that they could receive the wisdom to, to not just feel like they need everything right now, but that they could be patient and work hard and then choose to, to purchase whatever they want with the money they actually have and not to be foolish and get themselves into bondage to, to somebody uh, when they can't afford it, dear Lord. And we just ask you to, to please bless us, bless this church, and just help us to continue to reach people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.